Hi, my name is Ian, and this is my latest project. It's a model of a nine-cylinder radial engine. And I thought before I totally finished it and moved it out of the garage, I would take it apart and show the inner workings on how a radial engine works. Now there's some really cool animations and, and cutaway views of actual airplane engines slowly rotating with the motor, but nothing explains how they work or, or why they work or what's going on on the inside. So I thought I would make a video slowly taking mine apart step by step showing each major component and how they all work together. Okay, so what I've done is I've removed the front cover and some of the internal workings so we have a better view of what's going on on the inside. Before we look inside, we'll address the outside. So just like every other engine out there, a radial engine has numbered cylinders. Looking at a radial engine from the front, the propeller side of things, starting at the top, they're numbered counterclockwise. One, two, three, four, and so on all the way around. Now a radial engine always has an odd number of cylinders. This is because of the firing order. It skips every other cylinder. It fires all the odds and then all the evens. So on a nine cylinder engine, the firing order would be one, three, five, seven, nine, two, four, six, eight, and then back to one. The reason this works is because a four stroke engine has two revolutions of the crankshaft to make the four strokes possible. Looking just at number one here, cylinder number one is on an intake stroke and then a compression stroke. That was one revolution. A power stroke and then an exhaust stroke, a second revolution. So the radials, the odds will all fire on one revolution and then the evens fire on the second revolution. So I just said that all radial engines have an odd number of cylinders. I need to clarify and say that all single row radial engines have an odd number of cylinders. This is a single row radial engine. All that means is that all the cylinders are in one plane with each other, perpendicular to the crankshaft. You can have a multi-row engine, and all that means is that there's an additional row of nine cylinders attached to the same crankshaft. So the two rows of nine will give you 18, but each row will always have an odd number of cylinders. You can have a 14 cylinder engine, which is nothing more than two rows of seven, and the same for a 28 cylinder engine. That's just four rows of seven, but each row is gonna have an odd number of cylinders for the firing order. So for visual reference, I've taped on some pieces of paper with a P and an I. P for power stroke, I for intake stroke. The red will be for the first rotation of the crankshaft. The green will be for the second rotation of the crankshaft. So starting with number one at top dead center, it'll be on power stroke. We have a power stroke, number two is on intake, three is on power, four is on intake, five on power, six on intake, seven on power, eight on intake, nine on power, number one goes into intake. We made our first 360, and now we're switching our power and intake strokes. So number one on intake, power, intake, power, intake, power, intake, power, intake. Now we're back on power stroke. We've done our two revolutions of the crankshaft, and the sequence will start all over. The nine pistons are attached to the crankshaft using a master rod and eight articulating rods. The number one rod is the master rod and is the only one attached to the crankshaft. The other eight are the articulating rods and they have a wrist pin directly into the master rod itself. I'll spin it from the back to give a better picture.
Radial engines do not have a camshaft. Instead, they have a cam ring. And all nine cylinders share this one cam ring. The cam ring has two separate rows. It has a row for intake lobes and it has a row for exhaust lobes. The exhaust lobes are all spaced 90 degrees apart from each other, as are all of the intake lobes. They are spaced 90 degrees apart from each other. The relationship between the two is determined by where your lifters actually make contact with your cam ring. The further apart your lifters are, the further apart the lobes will be in relation to exhaust and intake lobes. The closer they are together, the closer they'll be. But all your exhaust will always be 90 degrees apart and all of your intake will always be 90 degrees apart. The cam ring turns at 1 8 the speed in the opposite direction of the crankshaft. This is made possible by some simple gear reduction. The crankshaft has a 12 tooth gear fixed to it which meshes with this 24 tooth gear. Attached to the 24 tooth gear is another 12 tooth gear which meshes with this 48 tooth ring gear. That gives me a 2 to 1 and a 1 to 4 which gives me a total of a 1 to 8 ratio. 1 8 the speed in the opposite direction. To better explain this I'll break it up into two parts. How you can use a cam ring with four lobes for intake and four lobes for exhaust to make your four strokes work on one cylinder and then why they use it in the first place. How all nine cylinders share this one cam ring. So to explain how the cam ring works on one cylinder with four lobes, I thought first I would re-explain kind of how a cam shaft works with one lobe. So bear with me if you already know this, I'm sure many of you do. The four basic strokes are intake, compression, power, and exhaust. During that time we had an intake valve open and close once and an exhaust valve open and close once. So we want the cam shaft to do something to the intake valve but we want it to open and close it one time for every two revolutions of the crankshaft. That's made possible by the camshaft. It has one lobe for intake and one lobe for exhaust. So the, the intake lobe here I painted red. So as we turn the crankshaft twice, the camshaft will make one revolution. We have our intake, compression, power, exhaust, our four strokes. The camshaft has returned to the same place. So it starts and stops in the same place after two revolutions of the crankshaft. The cam ring is similar but a little bit different. It turns at one eighth the speed instead of one half the speed. So if we look at this lobe right here at the bottom and we'll turn our crankshaft two times, that means the cam ring will turn 90 degrees. So although it's not the same lobe, our lifter started on a lobe and ended on a lobe. Okay, so I just explained how the cam ring works for one cylinder using four lobes for intake and four lobes for exhaust. Now I can demonstrate that. I've reinstalled the cam ring as well as the roller lifters for intake and exhaust and the push rods for number three cylinder. I've also attached a piece of cardboard so we can count the revolutions of the crankshaft. So if I put the exhaust roller for number three cylinder top dead center of this lobe right here, the exhaust is pointing to it, we will do two revolutions of the crankshaft. There is one and two and we ended up top dead center of this lobe. Again it's not the same lobe but it's another lobe. It, every Every two revolutions of the crankshaft, the cam ring will advance 90 degrees, putting the lifter in the exact same place as it started.